If you have a kitchen scale and it gives you the wrong reading, what do you do? Well, according to both Uncle Roger and a large portion of the Indies community, the right answer is apparently to throw the kitchen scale away and make an oath to never measure your ingredients ever again. Just use finger! But to me, it seems like there's a lot of people out there who want, or at least need, a way to measure how many dungeons they should put in their dragons. Or vice versa. So I'm here to offer an alternative. That's right, today we are fixing challenge rating. Let's get started. Ah, uh, challenge rating. In an ideal world, it would be a tool to help us find a sweet spot between so easy our players get bored and so hard our players get frustrated. Unfortunately, we don't live in that world. We live in a world where most dungeon masters have seemingly given up on preparing combat encounters and having a pretty good idea of how hard those encounters are going to be. More and more, we're starting to see dungeon masters fudging dice or changing the max hit points of their monsters in the middle of combat. And to this, I say... That's fine, actually, I don't really have a problem with it. But for me, I would prefer not having to do that. So I've identified five key issues with the way D&D handles challenge rating. We're going to go over what those issues are and then figure out a way to solve them. 1. Simplicity over accuracy. If you look at the formula the Dungeon Master's Guide gives you for how to gauge how difficult an encounter should be, you might notice that this entire section is written under the assumption that you, a human, would do the calculations by hand. If you do, I mean, more power to you, I suppose, but these days, everyone is carrying a supercomputer in their pockets. So what we've seen happen throughout 5e's lifespan is a bunch of challenge rating calculators, either as a website or as mobile apps, that would crunch the numbers so you wouldn't have to. Unfortunately, to ensure it would be doable by humans, the Dungeon Master's Guide had to simplify the math, even if that meant sacrificing the accuracy of the results. For example, here's how the Dungeon Master's Guide accounts for the concept of action economy. They give you a table, and according to that table, if you have one monster, you multiply by one, but if you have three monsters, you multiply by two, and so on. Then, if the party has less than three characters, you increase the multiplier by one step, and if the party has six or more characters, you decrease the multiplier by one step. So if you plot all of this into a table, the result looks something like this. And according to that, whether you're running three player characters against six monsters, or five player characters against three monsters, the action economy is about the same. I'm not sure where those numbers come from. Maybe there's some kind of logic underlying it all that I'm just not smart enough to understand, but from where I stand, it looks to me like this table is based on hopes and vibes. So if we get rid of the limitations of the flesh and accept the salvation of our new robot overlords, we can easily imagine a table that would look like this instead. If we're using a mobile app, this more complex table is not going to make any difference in how long it takes for me to input three level three players against six bugbears. But it would make a difference in how accurate the results I get back are. So as you can guess, the customary free thing at the end of this video is not going to be a PDF this time around. That's right, I'm adding one more online challenge rating calculator to the pile. But this one is going to work a bit differently than Cobalt Fight Club or D&D Beyond or whichever one you've stopped using five years ago. Because I'm not just going to take the Dungeon Master's Guide formula and then refine it a bit, make it a bit more accurate. Instead, I'm going straight for the method that will give us the best, most accurate results possible, regardless of how complicated that method is under the hood. And there's really no two ways about it. The most accurate way to measure how difficult an encounter is, is to run that encounter a bunch of times and see how it goes. Something that would be way too tedious to do by hand, but that a computer can do in just a few milliseconds if you happen to speak the elder tongue of JavaScript. The reason that approach tends to work pretty well is that, for better or worse, D&D's combat is rather simple. There's not a lot of choices you can do during combat. A fighter is probably going to attack 99% of the time. You can choose who you attack, but even then most of the time there's going to be an optimal choice. And players are usually smart enough to find it. So we can have a pretty good idea of what players are going to do, and the better we can predict their actions, the better we can predict the results of their actions, and ultimately of the entire encounter. There is still going to be a level of uncertainty. There's no accounting for bad luck, and players won't always take the exact decisions you predicted they would make. But just by embracing the idea that a calculator doesn't need to be simple, we've already improved challenge rating a whole lot. The second big issue with the challenge rating system is that it uses the exact same formula for every single table. D&D is a highly customizable system. Some tables use feats, some don't. 
Some tables roll for stats, others use point by, and then there's those who are objectively right and use the standard array. Some DMs dole out so many magic items that the entire party will run out of attunement slots by level 5, others will give you one magic item every three levels. And the beautiful thing is, none of those choices are right or wrong, except for the standard array. They're all equally valid, and that's not even going into common homebrew rules like getting a feat at first level or drinking potions as a bonus action. But every single one of those differences between tables results in player characters of different power levels. And unfortunately, the challenge rating system accounts for exactly none of these differences. It gives you one formula, and that formula is apparently designed around the assumption that you've said no to every single optional rule. If you said yes to even just one of them, then suddenly the formula just doesn't reflect the reality at your table anymore and is practically useless. The most common complaint I hear about challenge rating is that the system seems to always underestimate the players, but when you dig a little deeper, this is almost always the reason why. So wouldn't it be cool if this little encounter simulator thingy also happened to let you input a bunch of customization options, like whether or not a fighter is using the Great Weapon Master feat, and then those actually had an impact on the result of the simulation? So that's just what I did. And in the case where those options are still not enough, you can go in the advanced customization mode, and that gives you access to a whole lot more. You can use that to tell the simulator about custom items you've given your players, subclass features that have a huge impact on the game. For example, let's say you're wondering why your rogue is not dealing as much damage as you thought they would. You can just click on the customize button and, as you can see, the reason is that the rogue was not subscribed to this channel. But as soon as the rogue leaves a like on this video, now they deal a million damage and your encounter is now fair and balanced. The third issue with challenge rating is that the actual rating given to a lot of monsters seems inconsistent. There's a bunch of infamously deadly monsters like the Bodak, which can one-shot a player character of any level, or the Shadow, which can one-shot a player character of any level, or the Intellect Devourer, which can one-shot a player character of any level. And even though we tend to talk about these a lot less, there's also a lot of monsters which don't perform well. Take the Rakshasa, for example. It's one of D&D's most iconic fiends, and it boasts an impressive challenge rating of 13, but it deals only about 18 damage per round. Meaning, even if all of its attacks hit, it would take the Rakshasa over a minute to beat the average level 3 party. Something that would take the challenge rating 6 human mage one fireball. So since we can't really rely on this one challenge rating figure that the game gives us to determine how strong a monster actually is, we would need to manually input the stats of hundreds and hundreds of monsters. That would be way too much work, right? Anyway, on a completely unrelated note, did you know that between the monster manual and Modern Kynan's Monsters of the Multiverse, there are 248 monsters with a bite attack, 148 monsters with a claw attack, and 87 monsters with both a claw and a bite attack. So yeah, I might have spent a weekend or two sifting through hundreds and hundreds of monsters, so you wouldn't have to. Just like with player characters, if you think I've made a mistake, which, let's face it, is very likely there's over 730 of these stat blocks in there, you can go to the advanced customization mode to tweak whatever you disagree with. You can even save the result so that the next time you use that particular monster, it automatically uses your version of that monster instead of mine. One thing I'll note is that all player characters are set up by default to target the enemy with the lowest amount of hit points, but the monsters are set up by default again to target the player with the most amount of hit points. This is supposed to represent a pretty common tactic players use. They focus on one enemy at a time, and then as soon as a player takes a bit too much damage, they rotate to the back and let someone else take point. This tactic is common because it's usually the best one in most scenarios, but if your players are new or if you want to roleplay the monsters as particularly smart and dangerous, you can change those strategies and it will always result in a much harder, much more dangerous encounter. So make sure you experiment with the settings. The fourth issue with challenge rating has nothing to do with math or logic, but with language and presentation. When you do the challenge rating, as described in the Dungeon Master's Guide, what it gives you as a result is a label for your encounter. Trivial, easy, medium, hard or deadly. But what I've seen happen a lot of times is that people have very different expectations and wants about what difficulty they want out of D&D and what those labels mean. For example, if you have pretty experienced players, you might want your D&D combat to be about good tactics and quick thinking. But then, according to the Dungeon Master's Guide itself, your players want actually need any of those things until you start running deadly difficulty encounters. If you only have that one difficulty rating to play with, where do you go from here? How do you mark the difference between a regular deadly encounter and a boss deadly encounter? Where does it stop being a deadly encounter and starts being 
a TBK. The challenge rating system just doesn't give you the tools to determine any of that. So my solution is, I just don't show you any labels. I show you the result. You can see how many hit points your players still have at the end of the encounter, and that tells you how hard the encounter is. You can see how many rounds the encounter took. You can see which actions they've taken, how much damage they've dealt, how many times they've gone unconscious. And based on that, you can decide for yourself whether that encounter will be fun, anticlimactic, or tedious. The information you get is unambiguous. I don't tell you how to interpret it. That's up to you. We might disagree on what a medium encounter is, but you don't need my agreement or some label to know whether or not an encounter that looks like this is right for your table. And with that, we have a tool that's actually usable. It's called BattleSim and you can find a link to it in the video description. So go toy around with it and let me know if anything's not working as you thought it should. As those of you on my Discord server know by now, that sort of feedback is the only way I know how to make stuff that will be useful to more than just me. Thanks for watching this video until the end. This is only my sixth video so far, so we're really just getting started. If you've enjoyed this video and want to see more stuff like this, make sure you leave a like and a comment down below. That's currently the best way to help me. Until next time, have a good one.